Oh. Uh, buenas and half a day, uh, todos Hamzu. This hearing by the Committee of Public Accountability, Human Resources in the Guam Buildup is now called to order. The time is 1.01 p.m. for the record. And in accordance with 5 GCA Chapter 8, Section 8107 public hearing notices were sent on Wednesday, July 1st, adhering to the five-day notice and a second public notice on Tuesday, July 7th, 2020 for the 48-hour uh, uh, prior notice. In addition, these, this hearing was noticed on the legislator's website. It was at www.guamlegislature.com and written testimonies for these items on the agenda may be submitted by emailing speaker at guamlegislature.org or you may have deliver it to our office here at 163 Challenge Santo Papa, Hagatnya, Guam. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I wanna thank all of you guys for being here. But on, and on the agenda, ladies and gentlemen, we, we will have the first one uh, action item would be resolution number 324-35 COR as introduced by myself. It's relative to supporting the Republic of China, Taiwan's participation in the World Health Organization and to further commending them for their successful response to the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic. Resolution number 335-35 is introduced by myself, Tina Rose Munya Barnes. It's relative to, to supporting statehood for the people of Washington, DC. We also have, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, bill number 312-35LS as introduced uh, by Senator Mary Camacho Torres and myself, uh, Speaker Tina Rose Munya Barnes which is an act to amend section 4403D through F of article four, chapter four, title four, Guam code annotated relative to authorizing the civil service commission to now avoid personnel actions, which are in violation of existing laws or regulations and to establishing penalties for public officials who unjustifiably refuse to cooperate with such investigations and to further amend section 4406 of Article 4, Chapter 4, Title 4, Guam Code Annotated, relative to removing the application of the 90-day rule for post-audit investigations and to further amend Section 4408 of Article 4, Chapter 4, Title 4, Guam Code Annotated, relative to the enforcement of the Civil Service Commissioners. Commission. Is it commission orders? I apologize. Joining me here this afternoon, I see that Senator Mary Torres is with me. I know that my policy team is also here. Thank you very much. And we will go ahead um, and uh, share some rules of engagement. We ask those that are testifying to abide by the following, uh, to um, broadcast from a quiet room with little to no interruptions, Two, to broadcast from a room with adequate lighting, specifically to ensure that the participant's face is visible and not backlit. Three, to ensure participant's face is visible at all times. Four, to, properly, to be properly attired. Five, to use only respectful and professional language and conduct. Virtual backgrounds should not be utilized during public hearings. I ask everyone here to keep your audio on mute until you are recognized. Please remain in the meeting room for any questions by my colleagues and those of who, who do not follow these rules of engagement will be removed from this meeting. With that being said, uh, before I do that, I also wanna thank the audio team uh, from the legislature for providing us this outlet uh, for us to facilitate these public, this public hearing. And with that being said, we now move on to the first item on the agenda, resolution uh, 324-35 um, <clears throat> COR, uh, relative to supporting the Republic of China's Taiwan's participation in the World Health Organization and to further commending them for their successful 
response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I will share a brief uh, opening statement. Uh, this resolution 324-35LS was introduced on April 24th of 2020 in anticipation of the World Health Assembly that was supposed to be held on May 18th, uh, 2020. Although we were not able to get this through the legislature uh, expediently due to other legislative uh, matters at hand, it is still uh, important that the Guam legislature continue and, and, and uh, continues to advocate for a greater participation and elevate the health needs and priorities of our region at the international uh, meetings. And at this time, um, I would like to read a, a resolution. From If I may, just for the listening audience, and thank you, Senator Torres, again, for being uh, a part of this uh, public hearing. I will read the uh, resolution so the listening audience can um, uh, hear what it's all about. And it's relative to supporting the Republic's uh, of China, Taiwan's participation in the World Health Organization, and to further commending them on their successful response to COVID-19 pandemic. Be it resolved by the Committee on Rules of Imina Trentaisiklanalatur in Guam, whereas 109 years ago, on October 10th, 1911, the Republic of China was founded. The United States of America and the Republic of China have been friends and allies for many years. Throughout this time, the ties of friendship and the commercial interests of the United States of America and the Republic of China have developed into a strong partnership. And whereas the freedom of and democracy enjoyed by the people of the Republic of China, Taiwan, are clearly demonstrated in the progress and growth of the economy of this great country. In furthering its commitment to freedom and democracy, Taiwan continues to seek representation in the international organizations. And in April 2008, Ilesutun Guahan adopted legislative resolutions commending the efforts of the Republic of China, Taiwan to promote world health and had endorsed Taiwan's observer status in the World Health Assembly. The people of Guam maintained a special sister city relationship with the people of Taiwan, Taipei City since 1973 and believed that good health is important to every, every citizen of the world and believed that the access to uh, the, higher, the highest standard of health information and services is necessary to improve the public health. And whereas the preamble of the World Health Organization Constitution states the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic or social condition, Taiwan's 23,500,000 million, 23 people wish to attend the WHO as an observer and have a population that is greater than three-fourths of member states already admitted, admitted into the WHO. Because health and disease have no borders, it is in the best interest of the human condition that Taiwan be afforded observership in the WHO in order to benefit from information regarding the prevention, monitoring, and cure of epidemic diseases, prevention of terrorist biochemical attacks, and discussions of global health uh, policies. And whereas Taiwan's achievement in the field of health and substantial, including one of the highest life expectancy levels in Asia, maternal and infant mortality rates comparable to those of Western countries, the eradication of such infectious diseases as, co as cholera, smallpox, and the plague, and being the first nation to eradicate polio and provide children with hep hepatitis B vaccinations. And whereas direct and unobstructed participation in the international health cooperation forums and programs is beneficial for all parts of the world, especially with today's greater potential for cross-border spread of various infectious diseases, such as human in, in, immunodeficiency virus, HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, and the 2019 
novel coronavirus, the 2019 uh, novel coronavirus pandemic that has ravaged the world has shown the acute need for the complete cooperation of all members of the international community in the matters of health, because we live in the world that is closely linked by travel and commerce. Any loophole in the prevention and treatment network prevents a danger for the entire global community. And on January 5th, 2020, the WHO published their first disease outbreak news on the novel coronavirus COVID-19 and the public health response to the cases in Wuhan, China, People's Republic of China, prior to the WHO's January 5th publication, the Republic of China, Taiwan, initiated a series of 124 actions to respond to COVID-19, to the COVID-19 outbreak from December 31st to February 21st of 2020. And due to the decisive response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Taiwan currently has 425 confirmed COVID-19 cases and six deaths out of a population of 23,500,000. And on March 19, 2020, President Tsai Ing-wen announced on Twitter that the Republic of China, Taiwan is willing to contribute, contribute their capabilities to better protect health and around the world. And on April 1st, 2020, Taiwan pledged to donate 10 million masks to the United States and 11 other countries, as well as their diplomatic allies, Taiwan's commitment to their fellow nations during COVID-19 pandemic is just one of several instances in which the Republic has expressed their willingness to provide the WHO with financial and technical assistance. And whereas the World Health Assembly has allowed observers to participate in activities of the organization, including the Palestine Liberation Organization in 1974, the Order of Malta and the Holy See and in the early 1950s, the United States uh, in 1994, Taiwan policy uh, review declared its intention to support Taiwan's participation in appropriate international organizations. U.S. Public Law 106-137 required the Secretary of State to submit a report to the Congress on efforts by the executive branch to support Taiwan's participation in international organizations, in particularly the WHO. And in line with Taiwan's relation of Act of 1979, Asia's Reassurance Initiative Act of 2018, as well as the recently enacted Taiwan Allies International Protection and Enhance Enhancement Initiative, Taipei Act of 2019, Guam intends to continue to maintain relationships with one of our closest democratic countries in the Pacific. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Committee of Rules of Imina 35 and La Slatur in Guam does hereby on behalf of the people of Guam in light of all benefits of the Republic of China's Taiwan's participation in the WHO can bring to the state held not only in Taiwan, but also regionally and globally. Taiwan and its 23,500,000 people should have appropriate and meaningful participation in the WHO. <clears throat> As noted in a speech made in the World Medical Association on May 14, 2002, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Tommy Thompson announced America's work for a healthy world cuts across political lines. And according to Secretary Thompson, the U.S. government supports Taiwan's efforts to gain observer status at the World Health Assembly and be it further resolved that Imina Trentai Sinkun and Lesnatur in Guam, on behalf of the people of Guam, does hereby express its support for the people of Taiwan that, des that they deserve the same level of public health as citizens of every nation on earth and that we support them in their efforts to achieve its objective to become an observer of the WHO and commend them for their successful response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And be it further resolved that the speaker and the chairperson of the Committee of Rules certify and that the legislative secretary attest to the adoption thereof, hereof and that copies of the same be thereafter transmitted to the Honorable Tedros A. Gibreus, 
Director General of the World Health Organization to the Honorable Donald J. Trump, President of the United States of America, the Honorable Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State uh, of the United States of America, to the Honorable Alex M. Azar II, Secretary of Health and Human Services, United States of America, to Her Excellency Tsai Ying Wen, President of the Republic of China, Taiwan, to His Excellency Joseph Wu, Minister, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Republic of China, Taiwan, to the Honorable Chen Ching Chung, Minister, Ministry of Health and, and Welfare, Republic of China, China, Taiwan, to His Excellency Wallace M. G. Chow, Ambassador of the Republic of China, Taiwan in Palau, and to the Honorable uh, Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, to the United States Congressional Taiwan Caucus, to the Honorable Michael F. Q. St. Nicholas Guam's Delegate to the United States Congress, and to the Honorable Lourdes A. Leon Guerrero, Imaga Hagen Guahan, duly and uh, regularly adopted by the Committee of Rules of Imina Trent, Taisinko, and Les Latour in Guahan. It was signed by myself, Speaker Tina Munya Barnes, uh, Committee on Rules Chairperson, Senator Regine Bisco Lee, and our Legislative Secretary, Senator Amanda Shelton. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and colleagues um, here today, we did receive a letter. Uh, from the Embassy of the Republic of China. And it says, Dear Speaker uh, Barnes, thank you for offering us the opportunity to attend the public hearing. While it is not convenient for us to participate on low line due to the some technical issues, I am more than happy to provide some perspective perspectives of Taiwan. Participating in the WHO is a shared aspiration of Taiwanese people. Taiwan government has strived to achieve this important objective in the past few years, but been turned down due to political considerations. The outbreak of the COVID-19 has demonstrated that disease known that disease knows no borders. Only through international cooperation can we contain the pandemic and expedite the development of vaccines. Taiwan currently has been working hard to expand uh, um, anti-pandemic cooperation with like-minded countries like the US, some European countries, and, and donated surgical masks and medical supplies to nations and areas in the need to manifest the spirit that Taiwan can help and Taiwan is helping. Taiwan needs to participate in the WHA because we believe that face-to-face -face interactions build mutual trust and force partnerships key fa fa facets in strengthening the global disease control network. Through participating in the WHA, Taiwan can learn from the global community and contribute by sharing its health care expertise. I take this opportunity to thank you and your colleagues for standing up for, just, for the just cause of Taiwan and for the universal belief that health is the fundamental, is the fundamental rights of every human being. Sincerely yours, Wallace M.G. Chow, Ambassador. Um, I also have from the Guam Medical Society is um, Edward Blount's online with us. If not, I, it's really important that I just read this uh, real fast. There was uh, the Guam Medical uh, Society stands with Speaker Tina Munya Barnes in supporting the participation of Taiwan into the WHO. Taiwan has been of tremendous support to the people and the healthcare community of Guam for years and has proven to be a good neighbor. First, I would like to mention that Guam was short on uh, personal, personal protective equipment at the height of our COVID caseload. Taiwan heard our call and donated high quality surgical masks. These masks helped us provide care for our affected patients without compromising our safety. These surgical masks were, were the most needed piece of PPE on all of Guam. Taiwan has also donated this mask locally to our brothers in the Federated States of Micronesia and to the rest of the world as well. They have helped us when we needed it. Another way that Taiwan helps Guam is through medical referrals. 
Guam does a very good job meeting the healthcare needs of its population, but there are some instances where we don't have certain subspecialists of certain equipment available, and we have to send our patients off island to receive the care they need to get well. Taiwan provides a very close option with the top of the line medical care. Lastly, Taiwan sends its physicians here to teach our physicians. They have reached out to our medical society and want to let us know that they have what they have to offer and how we can use them. Also, some Taiwan born and trained physicians work on Guam and provide great care to their patients. Taiwan has helped both Guam and the Guam Medical Society over the years, and I'm happy to stand with the speaker in support of Taiwan's participation in the WHO. Edward Blount, DO, President of the Guam Medical Society, 2019 and 20. Um, I don't have any other uh, testimony, but I would like to open it to Senator Mary Torres, if you would like to share uh, anything regarding uh, resolution um, 324-35. Senator uh, uh, Torres. Thank you, Madam um, Chair. I don't have any comments. I think that that uh, what you've covered in the in the um, testimony and support more than sufficiently covers all the um, angles of support. So I, I have nothing further to add. Thank you. Okay. Um, I need to thank the good work of our counterparts in Taiwan, uh, especially the Taiwan community of Guam who continue to step up to the plate and help our community out in any way that they can. And we are especially grateful for the reopening of our uh, Taiwan uh, Economic and uh, Cultural Office. Uh, I know that we're going to be calling it TECO. Uh, uh, they will be opening uh, their office uh, on our island. And I know that... Uh, our island would be able to create a greater level of economic development and collaboration. And I want to share that uh, uh, this, this written testimony has been submitted uh, by uh, the ambassador of the Republic of China, Taiwan, and the Republic of Taiwan, Dr. Blount's uh, president of the Guam Medical Center. I submit that uh, to the uh, co uh, committee. Uh, for uh, its appending, and and if there's no other one or report to uh, resolution number three two four dash thirty five ls, I will call that this resolution uh, uh, be duly heard, and we will move on to the next uh, resolution, uh, which is uh, resolution number three one two. Uh, dash, I'm sorry, 335, I apologize, 335-35COR, and it's relatives to supporting the statehood for the people of Washington, D.C. I will be re- Real brief on my opening statement. Uh, we were very happy to hear the recent vote in the House of Representatives regarding statehood for DC. Uh, right now, uh, we do not have anyone, but I, I am going. I do see that uh, there are uh, folks that want to uh, present testimony that is listed. I think I will start out. Uh, with uh, Mr. Mark Wang, but before I allow Mr. Wang to speak, I do want to acknowledge the um, the presence of Senator Tello Tedegui, Minority Leader, Situs Masi, for joining us. And also uh, here to speak on another bill uh, coming up is the Executive Director, uh, Mr. Danny Leon Guerrero from the Civil Service Commission. So just thank you guys for being here. So with that being said, on uh, resolution 335-35, Mr. Mark Wang, I will acknowledge you at this time. All right, thank you, Speaker. Uh, off day, uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify on resolution number 
35. My name is Mark Wang and I am a rising sophomore and a member of the Public Policy Institute. When I had uh, visited Washington DC two years ago, I noticed a phrase on all of the license plates and that is taxation without representation. Now, having taken US history, it was clear that the events that led up to the Boston Tea Party and ultimately our nation's independence centered around the same concept of taxation without representation. Today, the United States prides itself in the ideals of liberty, justice, and freedom. In fact, decisions made in D.C. have demonstrated that the United States has no problem invading foreign nations to uphold these values that we hold sacred. Yet, I find it ironic that residents in our nation's capital are still unable to practice these privileges afforded to all Americans as defined in the Constitution. I find it ironic that we promote the ideals of liberty, justice, and freedom as a fundamental right, yet we do not afford this to all our citizens. And so it is absurd for me to see that DC residents pay more in taxes per capita than any state and more in federal taxes than 22 states, yet they still have no voting power on Capitol Hill, a national landmark right in their backyard. 700,000 American citizens and 30,000 proud veterans live in DC, but as defined by the status quo, they do not have a vote in Congress. The United States of America, a country that prides itself for its democratic ideals overseas, should not deprive any of its residents of the right to vote. This is an issue that should not be debated based on partisan affiliation, and neither should be influenced by party agenda. This is a matter of a government doing its due diligence and allowing its citizens to practice their basic human right as defined by the Constitution. I echo the sentiments of Mayor Muriel Browser of D.C. That is why I support this resolution for the following reasons. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mark Wang. And before I go to the next individual to testify, I just want to say, Mr. Wang, I'm, thank you very much for that presentation. And I hope that you can submit a copy to us, uh, to the committee. Uh, excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, next on hand, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I do have Isla Rodriguez. Is she on? Please proceed. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, speaker, and thank you. Half a day. My name is Isla Rodriguez. I am a rising sophomore at Brown University and a public policy institute intern in the 35th Guam legislature. I am in support of resolution number 335-35 core relative to supporting statehood for the people of Washington, D.C. One of the main reasons cited by the federal government as to why Guam and other territories do not receive the same rights and representation as those in the 50 states is that residents do not pay federal taxes. But as mentioned on the resolution, the residents of D.C. pay more in total federal income taxes than residents of the 22 other states. Therefore, given that rationale, I believe that it is only right for the residents of D.C. to have the same representation as any other state. Furthermore, like the 3.6 million people in the territories who are without full representation in Congress and without voting rights, Washington, D.C.'s population of 700,000, which is more than states like Vermont and Wyoming, are also without full representation in Congress. In closing, as a Filipino for Guam, this would also support the Chamorros people's dedication to decolonization and justice for their land, ocean, and people. Washington, D.C.'s fight for full representation is similar to the struggles that Guam and other territories have been going through for many years. I believe that Washington, D.C.'s success will pave the way for Guam and other territories to achieve the same results. Thank you for allowing me the time to speak on behalf behalf of resolution 335-354. Thank you so very much, Ailan. If if um, I may, uh, thank you for the awesome presentation. And if you can submit your written uh, testimony or your oral testimony, if you can submit a copy to our office, uh, to our committee, we would truly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, that being said, uh, I do have a comment that was uh, submitted to us earlier, a message from uh, the shadow senator for, of Washington, D.C., Senator Paul Strauss, and I'll go ahead and read it into the record. The fact 
that every part of the United States with a population that's majority non-white lacks voting representation in the Congress is not a coincidence. It is a long-standing pattern of injustice that requires all marginalized Americans to work together regardless of ethnicity. I thank Speaker Barnes for her showing of solidarity with her fellow unrepresented Americans at this important time in DC's history. Whatever path the people of Guam ultimately take, we in the District of Columbia will remember those who stood with us at this important time. Paul Strauss, Shadow Senator of Washington, DC. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I have uh, for testimony and messages. I'd like to at least uh, extend an opportunity for any comment from the, first the minority leader, uh, Senator Tello on this resolution. Do you have any comments? No, no comments. Thank you, minority. Senator Torres, would you like to provide any comments for resolution 335? No, no comments, but I just wanna express my um, appreciation to the Public Policy Institute members who testified. Um, you know, history in the making is always fascinating. And uh, even to have an opinion about supporting something is, I find a great privilege. And so I just want to thank them for their input today. Sijos uh, Masi, Senator Thoris, thank you very much. And with that being said, uh, if there's no one else on the list to present, uh, I will have called uh, resolution 335-35 publicly heard. Anyone else wishing to? Uh, I have just been noted uh, before we put closure on this one uh, that we did uh, receive a written testimony from the director of the uh, decolonization uh, Mr. W uh, Melvin Wanpat Bora, and he would be uh, submitting it uh, to this committee. It was asked that I read his testimony. Uh, Madam Huffaday, Madam Speaker, in regards to Resolution 335-35 relative to supporting statehood for the people of Washington, D.C., I would like to submit the following testimony. It is abundantly clear that in a road which values peace, stability, and cooperation, there is no longer a place for territorial relationships. Throughout the history, the United States has fought multiple wars in pursuit of liberty, freedom, and equal rights for its citizens. Yet in 2020, the structures that uphold political inequality remain. Guam has fought since the Spanish colonial era for our right to self-determination and our people have never wavered in our desire for a higher level of self-governance and the freedom to decide our political future for our own on our own terms. Unlike many other places around the world, Guam's stance on decolonization and political self-determination have remained consistent and our desire for recognition and dignity are not influenced by partisan politics. Ironically, even in the nation's capital, citizens are experiencing the disparities that are created by political inequality and the people of Washington DC have expressed their displeasure with their status quo. Like Guam, Washington DC has outgrown its current political status and incremental changes are no longer acceptable. It is clear that the only solution to the inequity that serves to undermine the very principles of democracy is to address the shortcomings of territorial political status with genuine efforts toward the exercise of self-determination. Many proponents of state would, many proponents of the state effort for Washington, D.C. consistently assert that the lack of representation in the, in the American political system has led to the symptomatic disfranchisement and mar marginalization of their 700,000 citizens. We, too, in Guam feel a sense of disenfranchisement, marginalize marginalization, and every abandonment as we deal with the disparities and challenges in an unincorporated territory existence. The government of Guam faces the challenges of inefficient 
federal funding, navigating unfunded federal mandates. We experience unilaterally unilaterally control of our local government by the federal government and yet we still consider ourselves to be American citizens and assume that our rights are protected under the Constitution like any other citizen. We have participated in the American political family in good faith, positioning our lands, our oceans, and even our people in war and strategic military positioning all on the assumption that we are equal partners and that we will be treated with the dignity and respect. But we have seen time and time again that our relationship is one that values consultation more than collaboration and mitigation more than mutual consent. It is my hope that the elevation of the political inequality that Washington DC is experiencing will in turn bring much needed attention to the same inequity that exists for the island of Guam. I look forward to the coming debate and I am optimistic that this will help raise awareness about the need for political self-determination on Guam. Melvin Juan Patbora, Executive Director, Commission on Decolonization. Thank you, I uh, was asked that I read, he uh, was in a meeting and uh, I want to thank Mr. Borja, Juan Pat Bora, for uh, sending that statement in. So, if there are no further um, um, statements from anybody, I will call Resolution um, 335-35 COR publicly heard. And if anyone in the listening audience would wish to uh, testify on this resolution, uh, please submit testimony. Uh, by emailing speaker at guamlegislature.org or by uh, sending it to 163 Hessler, 163, sorry, Chalon Santa Papa Pagat Guam 96910. Uh, ladies and gentlemen and colleagues, with that being said, we will now move forward with bill number 312-35 LS as introduced by Senator Mary Torres and myself, Tina Rose Munya Barnes. And I will go ahead and acknowledge uh, Senator um, Mary Camacho Torres uh, for her opening statement. And again, thank Mr. Leon Guerrero from Civil Service Commission from being here. So at this time, I will yield the floor to the author, Senator Mary Camacho Torres, you are recognized on Bill 312-35 LS. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd like to begin by reading the title of Bill 312-35 LS. Um, this is an act to amend section 4403D through F, Article 4, Chapter 4, Title 4, Guam Code Annotated. Relative to authorizing the Civil Service Commission to null and void personnel actions, which are in violation of existing laws or regulations, and to establishing penalties for public officials who unjustifiably refuse to cooperate with such investigations, and to establishing penalties for public officials, I'm sorry, who unjustifiably refuse, and to further amend section 4406 of Article 4, Chapter 4, Title 4, Guam Code Annotated relative to removing the application of the 90 day rule for post audit investigations and to further amend section 4408 of article 4 chapter 4 title 4 guam code annotated relative to the enforcement of civil service commission orders madam chair bill 312 recognizes that classified government employees should be hired and promoted based on their qualifications and not their political connections. If enacted, this measure would empower the CSC to terminate, dismiss, or demote a probationary classified employee whose personnel action is in violation of personnel rules and laws. Currently, uh, while Guam law already authorizes the CSC to conduct investigations and declare null and void, illegal personal actions, agencies can avoid terminating or demoting an employee by simply ignoring the CSC's decision 
and not issuing an adverse action within the 90 day time frame. To offer some context, uh, the 90 day rule is a, a rule that I authored, uh, which requires that adverse actions following a decision to null and void must take place within 90 days of when the agency knew or should have known that the personnel action violated existing laws or regulations. Um, that said, many times the 90 day window will have expired before the commission is asked to investigate or will expire before the commission can finish its investigation and make a decision. So to remedy this, Bill 312 would allow the CSC to directly serve the notice of adverse action following a null and void finding with or without the agency's concurrence. Um, this measure, Bill 312, would also remove the 90-day rule from such investigations and also impose a personal fine on any agency official who unjustifiably refuses to cooperate or delay an investigation. At the same time, Bill 312 recognizes that current law can have a catastrophic, catastrophic effect on an employee whose position is voided through no fault of their own. Right now, the CSC can null and void a personnel action even if the employee has been receiving favorable evaluations for many years and therefore had no reason to believe that his or her job was not safe. That's why this measure establishes a statute of limitations where the commission can only take action within six months of the effective date of the personnel action in question, which will require the CSC to act quickly within the employee's probationary period. I think, Madam Speaker, I'd like to note that um, Bill 312 simply reinforces what our Organic Act established decades ago, that persons appointed to classified service must qualify for the job. And I'd like to thank the commission, um, Mr. Danny Leon Guerrero, um, especially, and, uh, and attorney Eric Miller for working with me to protect Guam's merit protection selection process. And um, I hope that uh, my colleagues will, will understand the, the great strides that we're making with this legislation and support this measure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jesus Masi, uh, Senator uh, Mary uh, Torres, thank you for the opening statement. I, I first want to apologize. I do note now that uh, we have some other folks from the Civil Service Commission and I didn't recognize them. I, I understand we have the chairman, Mr. Juan K. Calvo, of course, Executive Director Danny Leon Guerrero. We also have a former boss of mine, Attorney Eric Miller. I understand. He will be presenting. And then we have Mr. Roland Farron, uh, who wants to just say that he's online for support. So with that being said, I will, Mr. Leon Guerrero, let me yield to the chair, chair Mr. Juan K. Cabo. What is that half a day? Madam Speaker, uh, Senator Mary Torres, and Senator Tello Taitanui, and the rest of the Senators. My name is Juan K. Calvo. I'm the chairperson of the Civil Service Commission. I'm here in support of Bill 312-35 to amend subsection 43 d through F, Article 4, Chapter 4 of Guam Code Annotated. Just for the record, I did present my written testimony, testimony on June 9, 2020. But if you can allow me, I will present my testimony before you today. I present to you in full support of the amendment relative to authorizing the Civil Service Commission to not avoid personal actions which are in violation of existing laws and rules, and to establishing penalties for public officials 
who unjustifiably refused to cooperate with such investigation. And to further amend subsection 4406 of Artic Article 4, Chapter 4, Title 4, one quote, annotated relative to the removing the application of the 90 day rule for post audit investigation. And to further amend subsection 44A of Art Article 4, Chapter 4, Title 4, one quote, annotated relative to the enforcement of the Civil Service Commission. The Civil Surf Service Commission was established by the legislature to administer the merit system in accordance with 1422C of the Organic Act of Guam and the laws of Guam. All departments and agencies under the executive branch are mandated to administer its own rules and regulation and laws in reference to recruitment and promotion of civil service employees. However, the commission as an independent entity shall work closely with the reporting authorities to provide guidance and to safeguard the process of personal action in compliance with the personal rules and regulations and laws. The proposed bill 312-35, as presented by Senator Mary Torres, will allow the commission to examine discoveries of non-compliance of regulatory processes of recruitment and promotion in accordance with personal rules and regulations or laws. The commission will also maintain the authority to terminate or demote employees after an issuance of the notice of proposed service action or final adverse action. Currently, the appointing authority has the discretion to ignore the commission investigative findings and to allow the 90 days, or which is the 4406 or GCA to expire, resulting in placing unqualified individuals in the permanent status. Bill 312-35, the current form and purpose, ensure the application and intent of the merit system, thus providing caution to the appointing authorities to hear conceivable penalties should such, work, such merit or processes be compromised or ignored. We therefore, Madam Speaker, and all the senators, and we merit uh, Senator Torres, we so, therefore support Bill, Bill 312-35 and humbly ask this legislature for their endorsement. I want to thank you. And I will now yield to the executive director and I'll be available for any further questions. And now we'll go ahead and go on to Mr. Denny Yongarel, Executive Director. Please proceed. Thank you very much for providing the Civil Service Commission the opportunity to testify for Bill 31235. Um, uh, we worked very hard on this bill and most of the product was done in-house without uh, any uh, particular bias other than to try to do our job. And that is to post audit successfully. We had uh, a few cases back where we did our job and we tried to post audit and to terminate the personal action. However, because of technical problems, we weren't able to do our job. All we're asking the, the legislature is to help us do the job that you gave us to do, which is to uphold the merit system. That's all we're asking. Um, we worked uh, with meritorious and we were able to convince meritorious that this is the way to help the Civil Service Commission. And I thank her for all the time and patience and stuff. 
Um, and I thank uh, also the speaker for being a co-sponsor. I thank you very, very much. And thank you, Telo Taitegui, for being here also. It's good to see you. Um, okay, I would just, uh, uh, I also, I, I encourage any ideas and suggestions to improve Bill 31235. Um, as you know, the civil service was first conceived in the Organic Act, Section 1422 reads in part, the legislature shall establish a merit system and as far as practical appointments and promotions shall be made in accordance with Schott's merit system. The governor of Guam may, by law may establish a civil service commission to administer Schott's, uh, Schott's merit system. As a result, the legislature fulfilled the mandates of the Organic Act and in August 17, 1967, with the passage of Public Law 9.9-86, um, that was pushed by actually Governor Manuel Leon Guerrero way back then. We didn't have a merit system. People were just doing their thing, you know. Wh whatever it is they thought they would, would, that was right, they would do, but there was no real guidance. Um, right now, we, we have a problem with uh, Civil Service Commission as far as the post audit authority. Uh, subsequently, there was a passage of law that removed our post audit authority um, and detached us from doing uh, pay classifications, rule making and post audit. As a result, we had a lot of people that were complaining that they, where do I go for, to file my complaint? Where do I go? I said, ah, we're here at Civil Service Commission, but we cannot entertain you. We can do only adjudication things, you know, like adverse action appeal uh, and, and grievances, EO, political activity, and so forth. Uh, so I guess um, after all these uh, demands by employees for uh, where to go, uh, finally we had some support and I think uh, um, this was back in public law 30, 12 was passed, which restored a post audit authority. And I think Telo, tied to be center, you were a part of the, uh, one of them that sponsored it, Bill. And I really thank you for helping restore uh, our now employed authority too, you know. I thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> the, when that thing was established, we didn't realize how much, how many, how many people were really um, happy that they had a, a place to go. And some people asked me, Dan, why don't we just take the null and void authority and just you just do the adjudication part? My answer to that is, so where do these people go? Let me ask you, where 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 would they go? You know, maybe they can go down to the legislature and ask for help or somewhere but there's no other organization that was put together to handle this. Uh, okay, so all we're asking now is uh, we put this legislation, it's not controversial, it's not adding new duties and responsibilities. We're just asking of you to give us the tools to make it work, that's all. Um, Finally, uh, the proposed legislative amendments in whole are intended to enhance the current Civil Service Commission legal and procedural process to perform its post audit authority. And I only ask you all for your support. And I conclude my, my testimony and I would like to introduce my legal counsel, administrative counsel, my Handsome guy, Eric Miller. Thank you. Up today, Madam Speaker, Senator Torres, thank you for allowing us to testify on this matter. Um, I'm listening. At the risk of being redundant, I just want to point out that there are essentially four 
modifications to existing law to allow us to enforce the post audit findings, findings where a position was improperly processed uh, or processed in violation of law, and one provision that is to protect the innocent employee. So as was stated earlier, this proposed bill would give the commission the authority to actually do the termination that was result of the post audit finding. Under current law, uh, based on the findings of the Guam Supreme Court in the two Sisuiko cases, only management can terminate an employee whose position has been termed null and void. For years, we went on the assumption that if we, if the commission made a judgment of null and void, that that was the end of that position. However, the Supreme Court decided in the Sisuiko cases that a classified employee, even if improperly hired, is still a classified employee and legally entitled to a proposed and final notice of adverse action. So when the commission makes a finding of null and void, only the agency can terminate the employee. Well, in many of these cases, it was the agency director, him or herself, who selected the employee in violation of existing law. So they may choose not to terminate the employee, so nothing happens. So this would take that away. This would give the, the, the agency director wouldn't do the termination. It would actually be processed by the Civil Service Commission itself. Secondly, the Supreme Court has told us, the Guam Supreme Court has told us that the 90 day rule, that is to say that you have to take your action to terminate or avoid within 90 days from when you knew or should have known the selection process was flawed or illegal. Well, in a lot of these cases, the agency director knew or should have known from the day they hired the person that the process was flawed. For example, uh, if the position requires uh, three years of experience as an accountant, and the application of the applicant shows that he only has two years, on the face of it, you can see that the qualifications of the candidate and requirements of the uh, position don't match. In that case, once the employee has been there for 90 days, it's impossible for the commission to take any kind of enforcement action. So this would take the 90 day rule away from the post audit cases and post audit cases only. I want to thank Senator Torres for all the hard work she's put in on this. We've had several discussions about the unfairness of terminating an innocent employee, a person who applies for a job, did nothing wrong, was honest in the way they presented their application, was honest in the way they described their qualifications, their education, their work experience. And then after being on the job for three years, four years or longer, is terminated because of some post audit finding even though they had successfully completed a number of evaluations. So this bill has a uh, statute of limitations on it of six months. We must, uh, the original complaint for a post audit must be filed within six months of the personnel action. We debated the length of this limitations. Uh, of course, some people thought it should have no limitations. Some people thought three years or two years or one year would be more appropriate. We finally settled on six months, but it's, it's an arbitrary amount of time, but still it gives us, it gives the employee uh, some fairness in the processing of their employment. I have myself personally witnessed the tragedy of the hardworking employees who had no clue that there was a flaw in their hiring process years before and suddenly find themselves back in the labor market. Finally, the fourth modification is to put a penalty on agencies, directors, who in bad faith refuse to cooperate with the commission. Um, this is a rare occurrence, but it occurs. So this is something to help us uh, protect the merit selection process. And I would be happy to entertain any questions if the senators have any.
Thank you very much, uh, Attorney Eric Miller, uh, for your presentation. At this time, I will go ahead and open up uh, for uh, questions. I will start off with the author of the uh, uh, legislation, Senator Torres. Do you have any? Yeah, I just uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Calvo and uh, Mr. Leongaro and you, Attorney Miller, for your, your comments. Um, but most of all, for all the, the work that we did into arriving at, at what was a good compromise with everybody. Um, I think what, what's important to note here in when we first proceeded with this effort, um, there were concerns by Attorney Miller about how to, how to, to right size um, what was really a losing proposition for the Civil Service Commission because of these technical um, nuances. But for me, um, you know, having uh, managed agencies as well in the government, it was very clear to me in these instances that the, the null and void and post audit function had to be bifurcated um, and not treated the same way any other violation of personal rules and regs was treated. In, in other words, through the, through the adverse action procedure, because that, that in itself was, was what caused a lot of the problems. So you know the idea was how do you how do you treat post audits as their own investigative um, uh, effort with adverse action taken separate and apart from because we always ran into the the question of when management should should have known um, that there was a, a technical flaw or a flaw in the in the um, either the placement of an employee into whatever um, hiring rank he was hired into um, or in, in, you know, in qualifications or whatever. And so the, the root problem that, that I felt it, it was always the post audit needed to be bifurcated from the usual adverse action because they, they, they really were apples and oranges. And I think that, that uh, the Civil Service Commission agreed on that. But I think what this what this piece of legislation does, more most importantly, is it goes back to the the intent of the Organic Act, which was to create a merit protection system for employees. And I believe that Bill three one two fixes a lot of those areas that were made it very difficult for the civil service to protect the merit protection system with post audits. But it also, I think, adds a level playing field too for anybody who, first of all, intends to violate the merit protection system. Um, in other words, management is, is obligated to cooperate or face penalties. Um, also, everyone is obligated to make the employee whole within the probationary period. You know, the probationary period is always is that 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 grace period before a, a, an employee is permanized into the classified, uh, into their classified status. So it seems only fair that in that window, you know, if there were mistakes made or oversights made or fraud committed on, on anyone's part, that it be vetted then and there in that probationary period. And that was actually uh, perhaps one of the, the biggest sticklers, I thought, in, in where we were compromising. Um, because it's a very short window for the Civil Service Commission, but it, it really puts the, the um, responsibility on everybody to, to, to get it right and to make sure that, that what they're doing before they put someone in the classified position is absolutely correct per rules and regulations in the law. Um, I, I believe that... Um, you know, we talked about the four points that, the, that this bill does, but I, I think that it it, in anything, it really is a very good um, starting point because it also allows the flexibility of demotion, where if somebody was slotted at a, a, a scale or a level that is, that, that is uh, above their qualifications, that you do have the um, latitude to demote them or right-size them. So I, I, I can't see any other way to be absolutely fair to everybody, um, to the employee and to management and to the civil service. So 
I, I just wanted to, you know, emphasize that, that, you know, initially this really was about how to take what was a system, a process that, that really could not succeed. And I think, uh, Mr. Miller, the success rate of many of your post audits um, weren't very good. Is that correct in the Civil Service Commission? In terms of null and voiding um, after post audits, oftentimes you couldn't enforce the null and void. Is that correct? Apologize, please unmute. Mr. Miller, you're not unmuted. We can't hear you. I know, we're trying to fix it. Can you hear me now? Okay, so yes. Uh, and I also want to emphasize that the statute of limitations that we have uh, offered in this bill would only protect the innocent employee. If the applicant committed fraud in the process of applying for the position, for example, if they misrepresented how many years of education they had and knowingly tried to, uh, uh, and knowing and submitted a false uh, resume, uh, they could be subject to an adverse action as soon as the agency discovers that they had lied about their qualifications for the job. So they won't be protected. Uh, they will be subject to an adverse action. The other interesting thing that Senator Torres brought out is we have to call this post audit enforcement adverse action, but the word is incorrect. It's not adverse to the employee. It's adverse to the agency that made the mistake in processing the the selection process. So that's what we had to wrestle with when the Supreme Court came down with the Sisueco uh, decision, which found that uh, classified employees who, whose positions are void by ruling of the commission uh, are still entitled to the uh, procedures of a, of, of a rightfully hired uh, unclassified or classified employee. So yes, this would this this proposed bill would give us the authority to enforce uh, the post audit findings that we just don't have at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll um, I, I have no further comments for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Douglas Mossy, Senator Torres, Minority Leader. Do you have any comments or questions for civil service? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity. Um, and thank you so much, Attorney Miller, for being here, as well as uh, Daniel Leon Garo and um, uh, the Chairman of the uh, Commission, Mr. Cowell. In fact, um, I'd like to go uh, to a comment that you made earlier uh, with regards to um, in the event, uh, you know, the, the bill it has great merit to it, especially the, the fining, you know, the thousand dollars. I think we need to put their feet to, you know, to the fire uh, in circumstances. But, you know, since you're here, before I go on to the chairman, uh, Mr. The Attorney Miller, what if the, the director, the agency who falls short in uh, uh, participating, that uh, the thousand dollar fine, uh, they call for a, a, an appeal or an extension. Is there any consideration whatsoever for that? Well, yes, the, uh, if, if, we, uh, if we make a finding that the agency director was, was refusing to cooperate in bad faith, uh, he wouldn't automatically be fined a thousand dollars. He has his remedies in the superior court. So uh, if he disputes the finding of, of bad faith, uh, he has a remedy to, to pursue. Okay, so um, my next question is actually to the chairman, uh, Mr. Juan Calvo, if I could um, have him on board. Thank you. Yeah. Buenas. 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 
So, um, Mr. Cabo, thank you so much for stepping up to the plate and doing what you're doing, especially in this um, in this uh, board. It's it's very difficult your job. Um, you, you you basically touch lives here, and and there there could be consequences to it, and that's always difficult when making decisions. But I know you're there for justice and and true to form and what's right. So um, I do know that the the bill, you know, incorporating the six months period. Um, it, it, to me, you know, Mr. Cowboy, you know government. And with government, it sometimes it, it takes them a year for, or longer than six months for a GG1 to even, you know, finalize or get through and how the government moves at such a snail's pace sometimes. So um, finding uh, errors or mistakes or improprieties uh, for employment, um, it's probably not known for for maybe a year. And I mean, in the Sisuiko case, I think it was two years before they realized. Um, I'm not quite sure the, the, how long it took. But from what I gather, I believe that um, there was a, a discussion amongst the, the board and amongst the, the management at civil service on the time frame of the six months. And um, I believe that uh, there was a majority uh, that wanted it for at least a year or two years. And then um, if, if I'm not mistaken, and then it turned around, the bill came out saying six months. So can you uh, tell me why, I mean, six months versus one year is really enough time, you know, to really find these errors or indiscretions or, you know, ways of getting into the government, uh, not, not with merit, uh, to allow that much time? Uh, well, you know, the uh, current statute right now, uh, uh, the law says that the department and agency head are required to submit all person action with, within 10 calendar days. Once the uh, commission received those documents, the personal action, the staff now will immediately commence the investigation or the audit of those positions, of those personal action. Now, if the action was processed inappropriately, or there's, there's a question, the staff will immediately, and of course the director, uh, will commence uh, communication with the appointing authority to find out exactly what happened to this personal action. And if it's, uh, it's, it's invalid or it's, in, it's, it's inappropriate, the commission will remedy that thing. The beauty of this bill, uh, and I, you brought up the issue of six months, and I believe our executive director and our legal counsel kind of make it clear that, you know, the employee sometimes is not your fault. And the question now is who at fault? Well, the six month is a probationary period. And the statute says that up to one year. So the six month is pretty much like is when the employee is still in a probationary status and the commission find that the action was uh, illegally processed or inappropriate uh, action, then the commission will nullify it immediately. And that six month, you know, is a still probationary period. The employee uh, can be terminated at any time. Now, if there's, uh, uh, if the employee continues to work and finally subsequently times one year after, the commission, there's a complaint filed that the employee was hired illegally. Uh, that's what this bill is all about. The commission can issue a notice of proposed adverse action, and perhaps because it is adverse action under 4406, there's three type of action that the commission can rule on, either to demote the employee, suspend the employee, or promote the employee, uh, or dismiss the, action, uh, the employee. So those are the uh, three items that the commission can you know, look into it and make a, an appropriate decision as to how the action will be taken. Uh, again, uh, that's why the six months again is back to because of the probationary period. And the employee can be terminated at any time. The commission, oh, sorry. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Calvin, so how many people? Uh, uh, the the uh, 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 Senator Tell, uh, 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 the uh, legal counsel will also uh, add on to those things. Uh, he's gonna be here with me. <clears throat> oh, 
Thank you. Yeah, if I may uh, help respond to that. The way the, the way the complaints come to the Civil Service Commission, um, uh, most of them will come from other employees who are watching the process. And they're the ones that will blow the whistle, file the complaint for a post audit investigation. For example, uh, when the uh, agency is hiring a position that's management, a lot of uh, people who are not management may be applying for that position as a promotion for them. Right. Um, and when they see who's hired and they know their background and qualifications and they see it doesn't match the requirements for the position, that will come rapidly to our attention. They'll, they'll know to file their complaint in that short period of time. The other cases where it takes a huge amount of time are instances where somebody wants to audit a whole bunch of people in an agency. And by accident, we uncover somebody who was mishired five years ago, 10 years ago, or whatever the case may be. And uh, that can be pretty catastrophic to the employee when they're not at fault for it at all. So, Attorney Miller, you mentioned earlier, if in the event someone out, let's say the six months period had uh, expired and that individual, because I think the, the public needs to know that if an individual gets away with being hired without the merit or the, or the requirements needed and for some reason slipped through the cracks, um, after six months that they're in, in, in that position, then they can no longer afterwards uh, be terminated or released if information came out that they didn't qualify or uh, for the, you know, they didn't meet the uh, requirements or the scale in order to be on it. Now, that's what this bill does. Six months, that's it. Now, if an individual, you said earlier that in, in, if an individual is, actually lied saying that they have never been in the government of Guam, that the long period of time that's required, or they lied they don't have a high school diploma or something like that, something as extreme as that. And the six months period had, had already uh, lapsed and they're in that position for some reason, um, is especially lying on your application. Attorney Miller, and by the way, how long have you been at the Civil Service Commission? Uh, Almost two years. Two years, okay. so. What would happen in that circumstances if they outright lied on their application with regards to, you know, you know they, they falsified uh, their high school diploma, they falsified right. information? Yeah. So let me make up an example. Suppose, the suppose the uh, person lied on their application, lied about having a high school diploma, and five years later, we're doing a post audit for a whole bunch of positions and we discovered this employee not only uh, didn't qualify, but actually committed a fraud on the agency by misrepresenting their qualifications. At that point, the agency director can say, okay, five years ago, you falsified your application. We're going to commence an adverse action against you for lying to us back then. And we're in time to do this because we just discovered it. If you are well within the 90 days of knowing or should have known, and uh, they had no reason to suspect uh, five years ago because they didn't know that it was a, a lie about the, about the high school diploma, that, that employee can be terminated. I guess they keep uh, muting me on the other side. So then in cir circumstances like there, when there was fraud, uh, the commission of fraud, then this would not keep protecting that individual, you know, forever and ever or what, because you know, what really gets me attorney Miller is that when certain issues like this come about and an individual is being questioned on their, on their hiring, how is it that the HR department doesn't catch this, you know, ahead of time, majority of these, from what I gather, um, they're not discovered until like, you know, six months down the line, maybe eight months down, down the line. And that's the reason why I asked how long you've been at Civil Service Commission to maybe you do already or research history. And the, one of the questions I was asking is like, um, 
How many times has CSC uh, experienced finding out about issues involving employees after six months period of their personal action? How many incidences ha have come across after six months? We were discussing that earlier today and it happens a lot. Uh, the, uh, after six months. I can't, tell you, I can't tell you the exact number, but I can tell you that. Uh, uh, well, just saying it's a lot, uh, you know, is, is takes pause by itself. A lot is, you know, more than 10, more than 15. And if you have circumstances here where a lot is discovered after six months, is questionable to why we're only making it six months. Okay, and, 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 and you're right about, it's a, it's a balancing issue. You've had, you're trying to protect the merit selection system. If that were your only concern, if the only thing, if the only thing of value to you was to protect the merit selection system, there'd be no statute of limitations. Right. The reason we're proposing a statute of limitations is that's not our only value. We also worry about people, and especially innocent people. Mm -hmm. So the reason for the limitation is to protect the well-meaning, hardworking person who is suddenly faced with being terminated for something they had no control over. Well, if they're innocent, Attorney Miller, then there would be no problem. You know, that individual is rightfully where they're at and they were hired based on their merit. It's those individuals who, who uh, you know, try to buy, bypass the law or have these connections to get them in these positions when there are people who worked hard and, and have all the qualifications. To get those qualifications are the people that we also should be protecting too, who, who have that ability to have that position. But my, my point is that I'm just concerned about the six months. And I, the reason why I was talking to um, Mr. Calville was, um, you know, I did some research and, and talked to a few people and there was not a real uh, full consensus on six months. And that's what I wanted to talk to him. I mean, of the commission, um, how many of them wanted uh, longer than six months? Well, um, I was advocating for a year. Yeah, that's what I uh, figured. Yeah. I, I think uh, one of our commissioners was advocating for two years. All right. I heard that. And, yeah. And, and some people advocated for six months. So years. Well, coming from, from your perspective, uh, Attorney Miller, you know, being that you advocated for you a year and being the attorney who prosecutes these cases and, and understands and very thorough in your investigation as well, um, I believe one year is actually conducive to what's needed here. Considering, you know, like I said earlier, a snail's pace on the government of Guam and getting things through or, you know, the, the anxiety of even you know, coming forward, even as a whistleblower, some individuals um, are even fearful of that, even though they, it's, you know, confidential, you know, a lot of them are, are still weary about doing it and have the, you know, the gumption to, or the goal or the guts to come forward uh, to act, act on that. But I would like um, uh, Attorney Miller to know those numbers of how many uh, cases were discovered after a six months period. Um, and I'd like to know those numbers and those that fall underneath the six months, it'd be very helpful to know. Um, there is a, um, is there a process in place to help address um, involving employees if issues are identified after the, after the proposed six month statute limitations? I think we kind of touched a little bit on that, but um, you know, for, anyone to uh, appeal, they could, I guess they can go through the process as you mentioned earlier. Um, there is something else. You know, I was wondering too on the HR side, uh, when it comes to, you know, processing the, processing the paperwork at Turney Miller and during your discoveries that you, you do, um, you find that, uh, you know, HR department really has the, their they're basically there at, at the forefront when just making these discoveries in HR? HR is a broad number of people. There are, there are so many agencies and so many HR departments. Large agencies have larger human resource departments. 
with, with employees who have more skill. Smaller agencies have a smaller, may only have one person who's a human resource person and their ability to analyze things uh, may not be as good as others. So yeah, they're at the front end of it and it's usually somebody in HR that made the mistake but not carefully reviewing the requirements and, and matching it to the resumes. Um, Okay. And, 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 and again, the length of the limitation has to do with what are your values. I mentioned the value of uh, protecting the selective merit system. I mentioned the value of protecting the innocent employee. And the third category is, as you mentioned, what about the guy who is completely qualified and can get the job? Right. What are his rights or her rights? You know. They were the most qualified person for it, and because of some other mistake, they were excluded. Right. So okay. you're right. I mean, it's it is a continuum of of short to to long, depending on what's the most important thing to you. Okay. Um. You know, I I, I think you know the, the, my other questions. I think I'll just. Uh, most of it was answered, but you know, I really wanted to get more into depth on this. You know, I think the Civil Service Commission is a commission that we all need to ensure that the process is done correctly and, and definitely, uh, you know, uh, justified and provide the help that the Civil Service needs in order to push forward on this. But I think that, um, Madam Speaker, uh, if we can get those numbers, you know, of how many of those uh, cases were uh, brought to fruition after six months period, the numbers there, and the comment uh, keep informed that, you know, there are certain people that, you know, like Attorney Miller himself, you know, advocating for one year and, and some for two, um, noted for the record. And other than that, uh, I, I will see all, you know, I usually call Daniel if I need any questions or the, the good workers over at the, the excellent hardworking individuals over at Civil Service Commission for any further questions that I have, Madam Chair. And I thank you for the opportunity for allowing me these questions and, and uh, all your work on this. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Can you folks hear me now? I, I apologize, we're having technical difficulties here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, thank you very much, uh, my minority leader, and to the civil service team. Thank you very much for sharing your your testimonies. I I truly believe and appreciate um, Senator Torres uh, uh, making me a co-sponsor to this bill and. I, know that she works really hard and works closely with civil service to uh, look at the merits of this bill. And, and, and uh, with this bill, of course, it ensures the application and intent of the merit system, thus providing that caution to the appointing authorities to heed conceivable penalties should the, the merit or the process be compromised or ignored. And, and, and I want to say that um, it's important that uh, we do take the time to make sure that the tools are provided to the Civil Service Commission to know that if things uh, uh, like this happen in the future, that that uh, that they have the necessary tools to facilitate to right any wrongs or to fix uh, what has happened in the past. I want to note for the record that uh, when we did ask for the fiscal note, that DVMR notes that uh, Bill... Um, one, the 312-35 in its intent is uh, uh, as currently written would strengthen the duties and powers of the Civil Service Commission relative to making now and void personnel actions which are in violation of existing laws or regulations. Uh, B, uh, they do also note, BBMR notes, that the $1,000 fine levied against individuals that do not cooperate with the Civil Service Commission in their investigations would have a positive but nominal impact in, in the general fund. 
They uh, also reported that CSC um, has reported to BBMR that the bill is will not directly impact the funding levels of the commission, nor will the Civil Service Commission require additional funding in its uh, 2021 uh, fiscal year budget should the measure become law. I uh, do want to just note that for the record to our listening audience that we did get the fiscal notes and the recommendations and the notes from uh, um, uh, BBMR uh, will be attached and appended to the to to the committee report. Um, I want to thank everybody for 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 being here and for presenting. I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Senator Torres, as author of the legislation. Again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be your co-sponsor, minority leader. Uh, thank you for being here and staying on, but also thank you for your questions and. And I know that I can work. We can work closely uh, uh, with the committee to work with uh, civil service to get the necessary information uh, when this bill gets up uh, on the deliberative floor, uh, so those questions can be answered. Uh, if there, I know that I don't have anybody else that is on with us to present uh, oral testimony, so I will uh, note that if. Um, There are no one else who wishes to uh, speak. Uh, hey, the I public. Oh, yeah, I do I apologize, mm -hmm. Senator Torres. I will allow you to close. Uh, just, I was just anxious in closing, but please, I yield to you at this time. Okay. Um, I want to. I want to thank everyone for their um, input, and I want to emphasize too that when this bill was developed over a series of months. It was developed in concert with CSC. In fact, what you see in the bill is mostly CSC's contribution. I had some ideas about the rules and regs that were not promulgated for over 10 years. Um, a lot of the, the issues with the post audit were, were a result of the law being not conducive to a very smart and successful post audit process. So again, I wanna just bring up the fact that when we started down this path of, of how to fix section 4403, um, it, it had to do with the idea that an adverse action and a post audit um, process needed to be bifurcated because they were lumped into the same, the same process pretty much. And that was why it, it just caused too many headaches and too many problems and it wasn't a very efficient process. The Organic Act contemplated that, that there should be a, a merit protection system. The null and void um, aspect of that is one sure measure of ensuring that the, the merit protection system is protected. Now, I, I also wanna know there's a lot of discussion about the six month period and the statute of limitations. Right now, there is no statute of limitations. And, and that's why we have these issues of, of, you know, complaints coming in much later or much sooner because there is no statute of limitations. The beauty of this bill and why it's smart to do it this way, and we've had a back and forth about how long that statute of limitations should be. But the beauty of this bill, when you think about the statute of limitations is six months, is it sets a new precedent. We have to forget what happened in the past. Because what happened in the past was a result of no statute. So whether you know there's a hundred cases that came in after the six month or or two, it doesn't matter because going forward, you're going with parameters that didn't exist. The beauty of the parameters is it now puts everybody on a, a, a playing field, a level playing field where now management knows that. Um, if they're going to request something, if somebody complains to them um, or you know, a classified employee makes a complaint, they have to act quickly. Civil service has to act quickly. Um, this is very different, the post audit is very different from a violation of a personnel uh, rules and reg where somebody blatantly lies or disobeys or you know, does something, that's a different action. I'm talking about post audit. Of a, of a personnel record. When you put in a parameter, you start the ball game the way it really should have been. 
you're obligated if you if you have an inkling or you have a suspicion or you're just not sure you request an audit whether you're a classified employee or whether you're the commission members or or an interested party in management you request the audit this the beauty of the 6 month and that was not a decision made that was a decision made um actually with civil service the idea that we needed to marry it to the probationary period and that's absolutely if you're an employee it's absolutely fair because at that point you would have done everything to demonstrate that you're worthy of the classified service and everybody has has shored up that that this person is in fact worthy of the merit gain this this classified position through merit so that was why we arrived at 6 month. If probationary period for GovGuam was a year then then a year would have been it. But you know the the reason people wouldn't act quickly under any scenario is if you had no timeline then then clearly you could sit on anything or you could find things out later. But if you have a timeline and you're absolutely interested in making sure that things are correct or you have a suspicion that something wasn't correct then you strike within a time frame. So I would clearly advocate for that. And then another thing too that I want to point out is the, the, the law as written named some agencies and not all agencies in the government. Um, some autonomous agencies, but not all autonomous agencies. So what the bill also does is it makes it clear that everyone in the government of Guam classified service across the board is now subject to this so that an agency who currently isn't written isn't listed in in um i think it's section 4403 isn't listed there um and a lot of times that was used as an excuse by management to say well you know i can do whatever i want i'm not this bill now wraps all classified employees under one umbrella so i i think that um i think that it it, it really we address what were, I believe, the kinks that Civil Service Commission very, very openly and honestly um, expressed to me that we had to take care of. This idea that they can issue adverse actions is, was a very bold move. And, and even from a, a, a prior manager of, of two, three large agencies in the government, um, I didn't agree with it first. But, but you know, in, in deference to their authority, I agreed that yes, you know, if we're going to give you that authority to protect the merit system, then, then that was a conciliation I was willing to make. I was really but willing to make that was a that was a very that big was a very big conciliation as well. As well. So I'm sorry I'm so, getting I'm back. sorry I'm getting back. Oh, can you mute your thank you. So I just I just wanted to um, to end with that. I, I think that you know we can we can debate many things about the bill, but I want to emphasize that this effort was in fact a, a very thorough effort with Civil Service Commission, and uh, and that where we arrived was a consensus. And there were conciliations made on on even on my end from from my point of view that. Um, I thought gave a great deal of respect to the Civil Service Commission and their authority and, and the intentions really that were outlaid, uh, outlined going all the way back to Organic Act. And um, so I, I just want to emphasize that, Madam Chair, but you know, this, this really is, is a, a restart for the post audit process. It is now bifurcating it from where it's kind of lumped into a, a fruit salad of sorts. Now it takes it out, it carves it out, and it makes it its own, where it's absolutely airtight. It's very strict. Um, it'll require people to adhere to guidelines and, uh, and hold us to a different standard that we weren't, uh, we, we weren't afforded before. And that's why civil service couldn't enforce it half the time or most of the time. So now it gives them all the legs that they need to stand this up. And uh, and truly protect the merit protection, the, the merit system uh, in the government. So, Danny, if if you care to, Mr. Liangro, if you care to add to that, I I really uh, just needed to emphasize and say to Aussie because this was uh, this was your your baby very much, yours and the commissions as well. I can say, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, 
We did everything we can to try to address all the problems. And our intention, our intention is really to exercise our post audit authority to nullify those positions that are in violation of rules and regulations. That's the simple thing. There's going to be consequences, yes. I don't know of any other department or agency that did hire someone that was qualified for their position. And somehow that employee may or may not be able to be successful in performing. Another thing is we have performance evaluations, all classified employees. And if they can't perform, we'll catch them. The minimum requirements a lot of times is an educational guess of what is the minimal education, experience, and other particular things they need that would make a successful performer. And it helps you to rate them and evaluate them systematically. Some people fall to the cracks. I've read a lot of literature about people that actually they applied and they were wrongfully qualified. And throughout the years, they stayed in the system and they couldn't believe it. They found out someone went around talking about, oh, so-and-so, you know, this is a, a rumor and they start and they look into it and they find out there was an error made in the application to get the employee out. There's all kinds of situations, but how can you fall an employee? I believe, I thought of it deeply. An employee that somehow didn't start right, but is performing the work and service in public service, and now you want to just go ahead and get him. And that's why it's the discretion of the director. If he finds out that the employee falsified the application, and he looks into the application and finds out that, you know, that maybe this is fatal. This person needed to have this and that. It's not following the law. It's not a performance issue. Uh, and then exercises their authority to, you know, to terminate or take adverse action against the employee. So there's systems, there's ways to address these things. But I don't know if any, uh, in all my reading, this has occurred many, many times. Uh, I kind of like, you're right. There's no statute of limitations. So, you know, people that are promoted or, or especially people are promoted or hired, they know right away, they send something. They have that opportunity. Go and file the Civil Service Commission immediately and we'll take action. Why wait all that time and later? Yes, sometimes if you know that there's really something then you should immediately file. There's nothing that stops you. You don't have to prove anything. That's our job. You file with, file it with us. We'll look into it. Of course, the workload would increase uh, and stop, but we can manage. We do our best. We can. And this is the best bill that uh, I struggle with it. A lot of things. I'm not one who likes to propose and support a bill because every time it goes to the legislature, in my observation, it comes out different from what you want. I thought maybe we just stay with it, but after we worked on this, we felt really good and comfortable about it, you know, that, hey, this is the way to go. And it's up to you guys, the legislature really, because the Organic Act gives you that power, that responsibility to set up the merit system the way you believe it ought to work. We just do the job. And all I am telling you is that we need help in doing a post audit. That's all. And thank you very much for this opportunity. And thank you, uh, my staff and my, my board in full support. They were pushing me all the time. Dan, what's going on? Where's this and where's that? I said, we're working on it. You know, we're working on it. We've sat down with, with uh, Senator Mary Torres many times and the staff and we worked it out. We thought we'd never get this far. And uh, we did somehow because of our faith in the marriage system. I think that's what made us plow through this successfully. So I guess I'll just end it there and thank you very much everybody for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Madam Speaker. 
Madam Speaker, I just have a quick, since Danny was here, I didn't have a chance last time I was talking to the other gentleman, if you don't mind, just one. Um, please proceed, Minority Leader, please proceed. Thank you, Ma Madam Chair. Uh, Daniel, I heard from, I didn't have a chance to talk to you directly, so thank you again, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity. Daniel, I was talking to Attorney Witt, and Attorney Witt said he had advocated for one year, and some of us other people have advocated for two. And considering, you know, the in-between part, uh, do you have any issues from making this six months, uh, in, from six months to one year, like that happy medium in between, um, and which was what he advocated for, your attorney advocated for. Do you have a problem with that if we made it one year instead of six months? It's up to you to decide. We provided our testimony. We, we supported the six months. There's pros and cons, and I really leave it up to you to decide on that. So you have no objection, no objections to going to one year? Like I said, we put in six months and we stand for the six months at this point. Okay. Well, All thank right? you for your honor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leongara. Okay. Thank, thank you, you Madam Speaker. Much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, uh, uh, Minority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Leon Guerrero, Mr. Calvo, and Attorney uh, Eric Miller, also uh, to the author of the legislation. Thank you very much. If there are no others uh, who wish to testify on uh, this bill, I, I'm going to share that um, the public hearing on resolution number 324-35 COR, resolution number 335-35 COR, and bill number 312-35 LS as introduced by Senator uh, Torres and myself. Uh, I would have called it publicly heard. Before we move to adjourn, I want to say that anyone in the listening audience or out there who wish to submit a uh, written testimony uh, may do so by uh, emailing it to speaker at guamlegislature.org or by uh, hand delivering it to 163 Chalon Santo Papa, Hagatnia Guam 96910. I, if I'm not mistaken, it is now uh, 2.50 in the afternoon and we are now adjourned. Sijos Masi and Sijos Bini DC, Hamza Todas.